unite wherever they meet, so go Big Red. <laughs> okay, um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today I'll be telling you about the dynamic infrared sky, very much in the Cornell spirit of Go Big Red. So we continue that theme. Um, but before I say anything at all, um, let me begin with credits. Um, this uh, by far is the biggest privilege and perk of my new job um, at Caltech. I have this fantastic group of smiling faces uh, in my research group, undergraduate students, graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows. Um, and they are absolutely the lifeblood and energy of everything I'm going to say uh, today. So 100% of the credit of everything I say next goes to these young people. OK, um, so this is actually a rather easy talk to give in this day and age, uh, because this whole field of multi-messenger astrophysics, where we are trying to understand the dynamic universe not just through different uh, pieces of the electromagnetic spectrum, but also through different messengers like gravitational waves and neutrinos. This whole field is quite literally um, exploding. And this is a slide full of acronyms just to impress upon you that there's a very, very uh, large number of new facilities and new capabilities that are coming online in gravitational waves, neutrinos, ultra high energy cosmic rays. Um, the optical wave bands, gamma rays, X-ray, radio. So we're no longer taking static, deep images of the sky, as much as Brian loves those. <laughs> we are also making movies of the night sky. So this is quite literally celestial cinematography, where we are looking for what changes in the night sky. From night to night, from wavelength to wavelength, whether we're talking about seconds in the gamma rays, or minutes or hours at some of the longer wavelengths. And I'll give you some examples of this as we go along. But you'll see, um, quite notably, that this list is missing any wide field infrared imager and any wide field ultraviolet imager. Uh, so today I will focus on this solving this infrared problem and telling you what this piece of the electromagnetic spectrum that has long been, ne been neglected, what it actually has to offer, even if you just begin exploring the tip of the iceberg um, in the infrared sky. Um, and the ultraviolet, well, you just have to invite me again some other day. <laughs> okay, so I begin with um, a simple sentence, which is that the dynamic infrared sky is pristine. Um, it is a place for very, for very boring practical reasons, which are twofold. One is that infrared detectors that you use to make infrared images are just astronomically expensive compared to optical detectors. So it's a completely financial problem um, that it's hard to build wide field, wide format infrared detectors. And the other boring practical problem is that the night sky outside is much, much brighter um, in the infrared wave bands than in the optical wave bands. So in that sense, because of the brighter night sky, and you're trying to look for faint things in galaxies far away, uh, the brighter night sky and the more expensive detectors have sort of inhibited progress on wide field infrared exploration and on, and on understanding um, the dynamic infrared sky. So uh, please take this talk in the spirit of, uh, of Star Trek. Um, I hope the power group that I had the uh, pleasure of talking notices a typo on this slide. Yeah? What is it? Right. So typo fixed. OK. Um, so um, yeah. So uh, no wide field infrared cameras. And I mean that quite literally. It's not just that I, I mean I don't have a wide field infrared camera. We as an astronomical community have suffered because uh, the widest field infrared camera is less than one square degree. It's actually 0 0.6 square degree. Um, and it's extremely expensive instrument on uh, the European Vista telescope. So how do we break this paradigm? The full moon on the sky is half a degree, right? I mean, we need really need something that is much, much bigger than that. To, um, to image huge swaths of sky at a rapid enough rate to find infrared transients. So I present to you um, a road map uh, with four facilities that I'll be talking about. Um, now I emphasize the word road map because when I started at Caltech, this slide was, I have a dream. <laughs> I want to explore the infrared sky. And all the senior faculty told me, you cannot call this anything more than a dream um, until you actually have funding. So, <laughs> so uh, three and a half years later, I'm very happy to change the title of this slide. Um, and I only put things in boxes which are realities, right? This is actually happening. Um, phase one is actually five years into the project um, with, this, with the Space Telescope. This happened last year in March. 
Uh, this happened last year in September, and we just got funding for this phase four. So don't worry about the details on this slide. These are just different ways to try to address uh, the dynamic infrared sky. And we'll come back to this um, in, at various points in the talk. So let me, I know this is a physics colloquium, so enough about facilities and such, right? Um, and methods. Let's um, really focus on the physics. Um, so why, I mean, OK, the infrared piece of the electromagnetic spectrum hasn't been explored before, so it's something new. But why bother fishing in new waters? What is there to learn? What physics can you actually draw uh, from infrared fireworks that's missing from every other piece of the electromagnetic spectrum? So I have a long list of uh, reasons. Usually when people think about infrared, the first thing they come up with is dust. If things are dusty, that could push the emission into the infrared. Sometimes people come up with temperature. If things are colder, then the peak of the black body is shifted out into the infrared wave bands. Um, there's all kinds of exotic fates, actually, which are just intrinsically cold, um, like stellar mergers, formation of stellar mass black holes, all kinds of unexpected things that we are finding. And perhaps less intuitively, and that's what I want to start with, is that nuclear physics forces you to search in the infrared instead of the optical. So let me convince you of that with two examples. And let me begin with um, the first one, which is uh, something that happened on August 17th, 2017 at 12.41.04 UTC. Um, this, was, um, this was just absolutely unreal and, uh, and uh, completely majestic in every sense of the word um, for a time domain astronomer. And um, I would say, you know, I, I dreamt of this and you know, wrote in my funding proposal that one fine day something like this would happen. But I don't think I had enough of an imagination to realize how spectacular it would be when it actually happened. So, uh, so bear with me. So there's a little bit of a fairy tale in there, too. But um, let's, let's focus on what happened on this day a year and a half ago. So at 12.41.04 UTC, um, two neutron star mergers in a galaxy that is 40 megaparsec away. Um, so that, uh, to the non-astronomers, is about 130 million light years away. Uh, these two neutron stars were spiraling around each other. As they went round and round each other, they were tidally ripping each other up, right? Because these are two extremely dense um, stellar remnants. This is the mass of the sun packed into 10 kilometers, OK? So um, this is extremely, extremely dense uh, stellar remnant. And two of them that are in the, these very deep uh, gravitational potential wells are coming closer and closer together. So I'm sure you've seen this slide and heard about this from uh, Professor Barry Barish. Um, but uh, let me just repeat that um, to set some context for the next few slides. Uh, but what happened on August 17, 2017, was that these two neutron star stars came so close that they merged to form a black hole. And so if you plot this in um, frequency versus time, there was this um, strain signal that you see here, which is normalized amplitude. And this was detected by gravitation. This is one part in 10 to the 22. This remarkably small change ripple um, called gravitational waves that was directly detected by uh, the LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston gravitational wave interferometers. Um, now, of course, uh, you know, these, this was not the first signal um, that these interferometers had seen. Uh, they'd already seen half a dozen um, black hole, black hole mergers by this time. Um, black hole, black hole mergers are great. You know, you win the Nobel Prize if you find them. Uh, but for astronomers, black holes are very black. When two neutron stars merge, they can literally be light. You can actually collect photons from um, this sort of signal um, when two neutron stars merge to form a black hole. Hmm? Absolutely. No. <laughs> so actually, you, it's actually not there. So in fact, the Virgo interferometer in Italy did not detect uh, this particular uh, gravitational wave event. But that non-detection actually was even more important to astronomers than a detection, because it helped localize where this event happened. So, so hold that thought. I mean, basically, if you have an interferometer in Hanford, an interferometer in Louisiana, that baseline is only a few thousand kilometers. It's not long enough. So you can't really tell. You can tell that it happened somewhere in this ring on the sky. But having a third interferometer that didn't see it, it has only so few blind spots that intersect with that ring. So it actually reduced the area on the sky to only about 30 square degrees. So the non-detection 
is actually really powerful from Virgo, that they were less sensitive than the Hanford and Louisiana interferometers, but this one was, was within their sensitivity range. So it actually had to break the degeneracy in where this could be. So upper limits are important, is <laughs> the point of including this in the slide. But this was by far the longest, it lasted 100 seconds, loudest, and closest gravitational wave signal uh, that we had seen. And it's still true, because after that, the interferometers have been offline for upgrades. The fun for um, electromagnetic astronomers like me began 1.7 seconds later, where right after this merger, um, there was a burst, a flash, that was seen in the gamma ray wave bands. This is the highest energy end of the electromagnetic spectrum, where there was this tiny blip, which was only a couple of seconds long, which was temporarily coincident with this event. Now, the fact that you see this within two seconds means that gravitational waves and, and gamma ray photons are traveling at the speed of light to, to one part in 10 to the, I think, 13, right? Because this, this, this neutrons and neutrons are merger is 40 megaparsec away. And from that event, we saw gravitational waves and gamma rays within 1.7 seconds of each other, right? So, um, so this was really amazing. Um, and once um, this gamma ray blip was detected, all time domain astronomers have cell phones that ring. <laughs> and, and in this case, they, they tell you that no matter what you're doing, stop, right? This is 7 in the morning. I was making breakfast for my two year old back then. <laughs> but you drop everything that you're doing. You teach your kid the word neutron star, right? And <laughs> no, 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 you hand them off to daddy. <laughs> but uh, you really, really need to take every telescope in the world and now look in this direction to try and see if there's any other part of the electromagnetic spectrum that lit up. Because the game that is on is finding home, right? Gravitational waves are great, but they are just ripples in the fabric of space-time. They have no, no position information. So if you want to know where inside this error circle, which of these 40 galaxies is in fact the true home of the merger, you need telescopes, okay? So there, was, um, there were many, there were about eight teams that decided to point telescopes at these 40 galaxies and map this 30 square degrees and look for a signal, look for a flash of light that wasn't there um, the night before. And amazingly, all eight teams found the signal. Okay? So there was a detection 10 hours later, because unfortunately, um, this event was very close to the sun. So you have to wait for the Earth to rotate and the sun to set in Chile um, to actually detect, um, take any images whatsoever of this, of this thing. So you had to wait patiently for 10 hours, right? Because the call came at 7 in the morning. Um, and you had to wait patiently for the sun to set in Chile um, before you could detect it. But surely inside this localization, so, um, so let me explain this a little bit better. The gamma ray signal uh, from the two gamma ray satellites are the blue and the green error boxes. So that's very large. Um, the two interferometers that detected it may give you this green banana here. And the non-detection from the Virgo interferometer gave you this dark green ellipse here. So you only had to search inside this dark green ellipse, which only had 40 galaxies. And if you rank ordered them by mass, right? Think, the more massive the galaxy, the more stars it has, so the more likely it is to be the home of the merger. Very simple. Then the third most massive galaxy in this list turned out to have this bright red dot, which was not seen ever before, and was in fact the electromagnetic counterpart to gravitational waves for the very first time. Um, now, as soon as you know the location of the, uh, of the event, then every telescope in the world with or without a wide field, with or without an interest in time domain, starts to look and collect data of this flash of light before it fades away. Um, and for this, um, you, know, you can't just have telescopes on one mountaintop. Um, that's just not good enough. This event was evolving on our time scales. So you're fundamentally limited by sunrise. So um, thanks to the National Science Foundation, uh, partnership in international research and education program, um, I have a collaboration of astronomers around the world uh, which are interested in this, in characterizing fast evolving uh, transients. And we managed to collect data in a ring around the world so that we're not limited um, by sunrise. Um, and if you, this is in the optical and infrared bands. If you're in the radio, then 
even the sun doesn't matter. So basically, as the Earth rotated, um, different telescopes were collecting data. And this just shows the data points of all the telescopes in the world, not just of my growth team, which was 17 telescopes, but the whole world, which actually uh, got about 70 telescopes um, around the world to collect um, data. So this was an exquisite data set, which um, lit up the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So we saw the gamma rays. We saw the ultraviolet, we saw the optical, we saw the infrared. Um, and then there was a long wait of nine days before the radio and the x-rays lit up. And if you want to know more about the jet physics, which is why the radio and the x-rays were quiet, please ask me. I have some extra slides um, at the end of the talk. But I won't include them in this description. So what do you do with this magnificent data set? You have all the information from the gra gravitational waves. You have all this information from uh, telescopes around the world um, that have collected data on this event. What do you learn about the astrophysics? Um, so the very first thing um, that uh, we learned was actually about where elements in the periodic table come from. So as of August 16, 2017, so uh, just a little over a year and a half ago, um, we, knew where, we knew that hydrogen and helium come from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. We've known that for very, very long. Um, we knew that uh, you know, some of these elements in light blue and dark blue are synthesized in supernovae. And we now have examples of thousands of supernovae uh, that are well characterized. We can even tell the ratios of different elements here. Uh, but heavier than iron in the periodic table, the things that are marked in yellow here, uh, there was a little bit of ignorance um, until this event, which is um, elements that are formed by our process nucleosynthesis, which is rapid capture of free neutrons were predicted in the 70s um, to come from neutron star mergers, but we had never seen a neutron star neutron star merger. So we had zero data to tell us where all these elements that are marked in yellow came from. And this event gave us the first chance to test this age-old hypothesis um, of whether this was actually correct. Are elements, in fact, synthesized um, in neutron star neutron star mergers because there is this abundance of, of free neutrons? So if you look at the, the light curve now in the ultraviolet, the optical, and the infrared bands, the first thing you notice is that the um, ultraviolet light just fades away in a few hours. Um, the optical lasts for maybe a few days. The infrared lasts for weeks, right? So that's already telling you that something is strange about the emission here. Uh, this is not what supernovae look like or classical novae look like. There's something that's inherently, intrinsically very red about these events. So when you synthesize elements in the periodic table um, that are in these columns here, you see there is, this is just the lanthanides that actually come up here. This is because you're filling out more and more of the orbital shells, so the S, B, D, F shells. So this means that the, uh, the, when you make, even if you made these heavy elements and then they radioactively decayed to give you photons, these photons have to escape out of this neutron star neutron star merger, but they have to fight against millions of line transitions along the way. So in astronomical terms, that's bound bound opacity. There's very, very steep bound bound opacity that you need to get through to escape out of this merger. So the emission was predicted um, theoretically just based on nuclear physics to be extremely red, right? So it makes sense um, with this idea that what you see here is very, very long-lived red emission, because the bound bound opacity is just pushing the emission into the infrared bands uh, from radioactive decay of heavy elements. Now, you see, still see a little bit of blue, and that's jet physics. So you could have a jet that is launched when the two neutrons has merged and form a black hole, such that you accelerate some of this material and literally Doppler boost some of this emission um, to the bluer bands for a short time before you slow down. Um, so it makes sense that there's a little bit of blue emission, but that the bulk of the emission is actually in the infrared. So if you take these light curves and you fit them, it's, the numbers are surprising. You, you, uh, it seemed like this neutrons and neutrons are merger had synthesized 0.05 solar masses of heavy elements. That's 10,000 times the mass of the Earth of heavy elements in just one event. Um, that's enough to explain, I mean, if you multiply that by the rates, enough to explain what we see in the solar neighborhood. And what was even more telling, right, what was a real thumbprint um, were the spectra. 
So this was the first infrared spectrum that um, I saw from this event uh, from the Gemini telescope in Chile. And you can see the spectrum has, uh, so this is now flux density as a function of wavelength. And you can see there are these really, really broad features. And I'm not even trying to fit this data. I'm taking a model prediction from 2013 by Professor Dan Kaysen at UC Berkeley and his graduate student, Jennifer Barnes, and just overplotting it. And you can see the red and the black are not that far off, given that I'm taking a canned model from many years ago and just overplotting it on the data. And these weird, very broad features are because there's not just one line, right? There's so many rows in the periodic table that are being synthesized that there are many, many lines and many, many transitions that are all getting blended together at high velocity. So this bump here and here is not attributable to one element, but to a combination of many, many elements. So if now instead of one spectrum, you actually have a series of spectra, and this is from the ESO VLT X shooter instrument for those uh, uh, who are interested, um, you can see that what started off as a very bright blue flash becomes a very long-lived infrared event. And each of these bumps and wiggles give um, our theorists lots of work to do to try and figure out which elements are there. And even in the first set of papers, there's a lot of debate on which elements are we definitely seeing evidence for, because it's actually a complex mix. So Dan Kaysen suggested that without neodymium, you can't explain any of these bumps. Stephen Smart suggested that maybe there's some cesium, um, some tellurium. Uh, the Japanese group had five other elements that they thought were crucially important to contribute to these bumps in their shapes. But I think we have our work cut out to try and see which of the heavy elements were synthesized. But there was no question in anybody's mind, anybody collecting any of the observers or the theorists' mind, that heavy elements were definitely synthesized. The open questions remained, okay, which, exactly which elements were produced and in what relative ratio. So now if you step back and just look at Earth and look at how much of each of the different elements in the periodic table actually exist or not, then this here is the solar R process abundance as a function of atomic mass number. Um, so these are all the elements in the periodic table between 70 and about 220 or so. Um, and what, what people have, this is just abundance, how much of that element is there on Earth. And in terms of abundance peaks, there are, they call, they note three abundance peaks. And the literature calls out this bump as a lanthanide bump, um, because there are lanthanides in this, in this region. Absolutely. Okay. And yeah. Stuff. Exactly. Which is, so, you know, distribution where it seems to know well, your merger produces the rate of an earth, right? Right. But the question is um, if, you, if you do a cumulative version of this, then on Earth you have a lot more first peak elements, lighter elements like silver, than compared to second and third peak elements, which include things like gold and platinum and uranium, right? So the question is, I mean, are we at least producing? The only question I'm asking is very qualitative, which is, are neutron cell mergers producing all elements in all three peaks? Not exactly which element and how much, right? Because that is a function of how radioactive they are, what the half-lives are, what you see at what time. So if you say, um, OK, let's assume that the abundance distribution is such that it explains what's on Earth. And you just have one number, which is the total amount of material. So that's 10,000 Earth masses multiplied by one neutron cell neutron cell merger per 10,000 years per galaxy. That's the rate that we infer with large error bars because you only have one event. So don't take my rate numbers seriously here. Uh, but if you multiply these two numbers, you get what's in the ballpark of the observed solar abundance. So that's interesting, right? I'm not saying this is the only site, right? But the question of Earth site or their site is very interesting. At least it's not much less or much more than what we see on Earth. Right? So this is a, a dominant site, at the very least, if not the site of, of heavy element nucleosynthesis. And all of this d d depends on the details of the relative ratios of the different elements and the rates that are inferred. Now, there's a, there was a lot of debate um, early on uh, with data from just the first um, few months on whether or not all three peaks were synthesized. Um, there was a paper by Stefan Roswog which showed that all of this early data, the light curves that I showed you, can be fit with just the first peak alone. So you didn't need any gold and platinum. You just needed silver. And you could explain it, right? 
that was very, I mean, that was, I mean, basically the, the goodness of the fit from the model was not improving because you were dominated um, by the lightest elements. There's a tiny fraction, maybe 10 Earth masses out of 10,000 Earth masses was this very heavy third peak. So how do we know that there's any evidence of the second peak and third peak? And for that, we had to wait for the Spitzer Space Telescope, um, which is uh, NASA's fourth great observatory, uh, which has a unique view in the mid-infrared wave bands. It's on this orbit uh, called the L2 orbit, where it can either look very close to the sun or exactly opposite. So uh, when all ground-based observatories gave up, because the target was just way too close to the sun to not burn a hole <laughs> through your instruments if you tried to observe, that's when the Spitzer Space Telescope was able to collect data. So we managed to get observations at 43. So the ground-based data sort of stopped here, no matter what size telescope you had and where in the world. Um, and the Spitzer Space Telescope was able to get detections down here at 43 days and 74 days. And this was absolutely critical uh, because of the point brought up um, earlier, which is half-lives. So if you look at half-lives, the light elements, half-life distribution and their contribution to the fraction of electron heating is dominated only in the first 20-something days and then drops off. That's this green line here. And then the heavier elements have longer half-lives and dominate in the later part of the, uh, of, uh, the explosion. So the fact that we are seeing such bright emission from the Spitzer Space Telescope in the reddest band at such late time was actually evidence that we have elements from the second and third peak. Um, and in fact, these are just two data points, right? There's not a lot of lot here. But those two data points are absolutely critical to this question of whether we indeed struck gold when, we, when these two neutron stars merged, right? Whether the gold in your wedding band truly was made in, <laughs> in neutron star mergers. That was the funniest part of the press release that um, I think most people caught on, but, <laughs> but the, the question of whether gold was synthesized is very nuanced, right? It really hinges, I mean, the, this is the only data I would say that's in, in favor of the, there being the heaviest um, elements in fact being synthesized. So all of this is just to motivate that the infrared for nuclear physics reasons is a very important piece of the electromagnetic spectrum. None of this depends on the shape of uh, emission or properties of the emission at any other wave band. Anything that we want to learn about heavy element nucleosynthesis depends on the infrared, which is the fact that this very blue dot evolved into a very red dot, and then the emission was sustained in the infrared wave bands. The other thing that's cool about the infrared is that it's ubiquitous. Um, just next month, um, the LIGO and Virgo interferometers will be back online, um, and again in the business of searching for gravitational waves, and will be even more sensitive. Um, and in, this, in the case of neutron star neutron star mergers, there are many reasons, like the mass ratio, the viewing angle, the remnant lifetime, things that suppress this blue emission. We were quite lucky that the first event that we saw um, had any blue emission at all. Um, if it's a neutron star black hole merger, it's all red emission. So we, we really need to be prepared to look for infrared counterparts to neutron star and neutron star mergers of any type. And in preparation of this next phase, where uh, more and more gravitational wave events get, uh, uh, get detected, uh, we've uh, designed this experiment called the Winter Experiment. Uh, so the technical details of this is that this is a one meter telescope at Palomar Observatory, which is much closer to you than to me. <laughs> it's only an hour's drive, I think, for you, and more than two hours' drive for me. Um, it's on the way to San Diego. Please visit. But on Palomar Observatory, we're putting a new one meter telescope uh, with a one square degree camera in the infrared uh, made out of indium gallium arsenide detectors. And the design is such that we can detect an event like this gravitational wave uh, event that happened only at 40 megaparsec all the way out to 200 megaparsec, out to the sensitivity horizon of these gravitational wave interferometers. So we have better samples of events um, to work with um, to try and constrain this problem. Uh, meanwhile, it takes a couple of years to build this new telescope and this new instrument. Um, so meanwhile, we do the best we can um, with facilities on the ground right now. So I'm going to give you a few examples of existing facilities and searches for infrared or red transients from them. Um, so I begin with um, the Zwicky transient facility which is also on Palomar Mountain at Palomar Observatory. And this is a wide field optical camera. So this is a camera with a field of view of 47 square degrees. 
So this is 230 full moons in one shot. We image the sky at a rate of nearly 4,000 square degrees per hour. And every night, we generate a public alert stream seven minutes after observations. We collect the data. Seven minutes later, alerts go out. And something like 100,000 alerts on things that have changed in the night sky every single night. So if you're interested in becoming a time domain astronomer, <laughs> then you should listen to this alert stream and figure out a way to sift through this data. You need tools to try to manage this large data set to identify what science questions you want to answer. So, um, so we designed this tool called a, a follow-up marshal, just for a fun name, which will ingest all of these alerts, go into different science program definitions or filters, and then coordinate follow-up from all of these different telescopes, because you can't just keep it all in your head. It will not be organized. So there's a database that, that powers this um, organization, and this is a science portal that over 100 astronomers around the world are using now to try and understand and make sense of this Wikitransient facility um, data set. So for example, let's put a filter there saying, I want to find kilonovae, which are what um, these neutron sum mergers are called, even without gravitational waves. Why wait for a gravitational wave trigger to go and look for a neutron star neutron star merger? I know what they look like. They're very red events. They start off blue, and then they become very, very red. Uh, so I'm, this is just a teaser. So we are starting to find events like this, where the optical emission dies off in a few days, but the infrared emission could last for more than a month. So this is data from the Keck telescope that I know many of you use in the room where a month later we are detecting something that's long gone in the infrared, which is long gone in the optical. Um, but there's a question mark on whether or not what the origin of this event is. But point is you can search for red transients, um, the reddest transients in the optical stream to try and look for kilonovae, even when uh, the gravitational wave interferometers are offline. Even more fun, um, so to speak, is to uh, try and find um, those neutron star mergers before they merge, right? It's actually, I, I don't know how many of you have had a, a course on stellar evolution, but it's really, really hard to try and form a system which has two neutron stars, two very, very dense objects that will actually merge in less than Hubble time and, and form a black hole. Um, most neutron stars don't do that, right? There's a small fraction of them that, that can do this. And, and the problem of, you know, how do you start off with two massive stars which will evolve on their, on their own way. The more massive star will have the shorter lifetime, explode as a normal supernova, maybe form a high mass X-ray binary. Somehow you have to get from these well understood stages, there's this sort of jump from how you go from a high mass X-ray binary to this double neutron star system that will merge in a Hubble time. And people have made many guesses on what happens between a high mass X-ray binary phase and a double neutron star system. The problem is, that the second star, the second neutron star, has to also explode as a supernova, right? And somehow that should not destroy the system, right? <laughs> supernovae are very powerful events. So how do you have a second supernova that is, won't destroy the system and be so close that this neutron star binary would be compact enough to merge in a Hubble time? So there's been a lot of interest in trying to find a supernova where there's a lot of stripping of material. This massive star that's, say, 20 solar masses gets stripped down to less than a solar mass before it explodes. Um, so there is interest in trying to understand a common envelope path where there's extreme stripping, and then a supernova that has very, a core collapse supernova that has very, very, very little amount of ejector. And after having looked through thousands of supernovae, we finally found one event which meets this criteria, where you see a core collapse supernova with no hydrogen, um, only flash ionized helium, no, no helium at late time, and very, very little ejecta, only 0.2 solar masses of ejecta. So this is what we call an ultra-stripped supernova, which is the theoretical um, precursor to the formation of a compact neutron star, neutron star system um, before it actually merges. So our light curves, uh, the intensity as a function of time, show a shock breakout and then this uh, more uh, radioactive pow radioactivity powered peak. And our spectra match what has been predicted um, for such an extreme event that was so uh, stripped at the time of explosion. 
So um, there does seem to be vi viable paths to make neutron stars that are compact enough to merge in less than a Hubble time. We just have to find more of these um, ultra-stripped supernovae. OK, um, so now I'm going to switch topics a little bit um, uh, to give you other examples of infrared transients that are interesting um, in their own right. Um, but any questions so far on the gravitational wave counterparts? Right. Mm -hmm. You're concerned that it's going to disrupt it, but I mean, it's a tiny 10 kilometer thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many AU or parsecs away. Mm -hmm. It's not really going to absorb a lot of energy. But I want it to be much closer to merging less than a Hubble time. So it's not that you're concerned about it pushing away, it's that it needs to come in. It needs to come in, yeah. right. So, I, so you need to go through this common envelope phase so that you're much, much closer at the time of the explosion. Because you don't, otherwise, it will take infinite time to come close enough to merge. Right, because I want to see the merger with gravitational waves in this life. <laughs> OK, um, yeah, so that's a great question. Any other questions, or can we move on to add other examples of infrared fireworks? OK, so another example, which is also a nuclear physics um, example, is now not neutrons or neutron star mergers, but white dwarf, white dwarf mergers. Um, so we know um, that white dwarfs explode. Uh, there was a Nobel Prize in physics given for, to uh, people who discovered type 1a e supernovae and used them for cosmology to derive Hubble's constant um, to some precision. So we know that happens. But um, what we don't know even today is how that happens. What actually causes a white dwarf to explode as a type 1a e supernova? And there are many ideas of you know, how it's stealing material from its companion, and this companion should be a red giant, or it should be a red supergiant, or it should be another white dwarf. Much debate on what the companion is that it's stealing material from before it explodes. And one of the ideas that people had put out there was that it's actually a helium white dwarf that's transferring material on top of a carbon oxygen white dwarf. And as this helium white dwarf dumps material onto the carbon oxygen white dwarf, this entire shell of material forms. The shell, helium shell, explodes, and that causes the core to explode. So this was the front runner for various detailed reasons that we shouldn't get into. But the problem was that this predicted that type 1a supernovae would be very red events. And they were actually very blue, right? So the observations were in conflict with, um, with what this, this front running model was predicting. Now, um, we found this very rare event with this Wiki transient facility. Um, where, um, you know, if you look at this part of the spectrum, you see the sulfur line, sulfur 2 line, you see the silicon line, you see this calcium feature. This part of the spectrum looks like a normal type 1e supernova, but something cuts off the flux below 5,000 angstrom. So if you look below 5,000 angstrom, there's nothing there. The, normally, it's screaming up here, and there are a lot more features there. So what is suppressing the blue part and making this a very red event? This goes back to this model of a helium shell where you form enough ion group elements that there's line blanketing that actually suppresses. There's so many, so many line transitions in this region from the ion group ashes that that suppresses the emission in this uh, blue part of the spectrum. So finding very red type 1a e supernovae, wide dwarf explosions, again, due to just the mechanics of, of the line transitions in the ion group can give you very red transients. So this happens at least sometime, but if it's such a red event, we should be looking in the infrared, not in the, in the optical, right? So this again motivates um, the search in the infrared wave bands. And in this case, you would need a very, very thick helium shell. So the helium shell mass is 0.15 solar masses out of a white dwarf that's only 0.75 solar masses. So it's 20% of the mass of the white dwarf. Um, that's the size of the shell that's exploding to cause the, the white dwarf to explode. We would like to, right? This one is very nearby. Um, but we would like to find them. Because if you want to do cosmology, you want to go out to higher and higher edges. OK, um, so let me give you another example, um, a dustier example of why we should um, study transients in the infrared. 
Um, so uh, let, me, let me introduce one of the other surveys that I had on the roadmap slide. Um, this is the Palomar Gattini IR survey. Yet another robotic telescope at Palomar Observatory. I hope I'm convincing you to drive to Palomar Observatory. How many people have been there? Oh, that's not so bad. Only five, though. Brian, introduce something about this. <laughs> Field trip. <laughs> OK, but this is another new telescope at Palomar Observatory. It's just a 30 centimeter telescope, so it's only about this big. But it has a very fast beam, so focal ratio of only 1.4. That means the entire telescope is just this big, right? But because it has a fast focal beam, uh, focal ratio, it has a very wide field. So in one, with one detector, uh, one 2K by 2K detector, we get a field of view that covers the entire Andromeda galaxy and more. Right? This is 25 square degrees. And this is 42 times larger than the slide that I showed up of these very expensive instruments, which don't even make one square degree um, field of view in the infrared. So finally, I now have um, commissioned, uh, just on September 2018, a new instrument that can image the infrared night sky all night, all of the sky, night after night. So we imaged 15,000 square degrees um, for the astronomers to a depth of 16th mag, um, night after night. So what this does is really opens up the infrared sky for um, blind exploration of rare transients um, in, a, in a way that just wasn't possible before because you didn't have the instruments to do this. What this means is that if there's a galactic supernova, right, and if you are interested in multi messenger astronomy, but from the neutrino standpoint, not so much from the gravitational wave standpoint, um, then if there's a, a supernova that goes off in our own galaxy, um, and one of the things that keeps me up, at least at night, is that we won't even know about it, right? Perhaps, hopefully, the neutrino detectors are on and they'll detect neutrinos, but the galaxy is so full of extinction, there's so much extinction along the line of sight, that the most probable place where all the stars are in our own galaxy is the dustiest place. There's so much extinction just along the line of, line of sight that we may miss it if we were just looking at the skies and the optical wave bands. And that would be a tragedy. We're now detecting supernovae out to such high redshift that if we miss one in our own galaxy, and it only happens once a century, um, I, I, at least if it happens in my lifetime, I don't want to miss it. So, so I want to know where to look. So the way to get around dust in our own galaxy and see a supernova in our own galaxy, as rare as the possibility um, this is, is to build an all-sky infrared scanner. And uh, this plot, again, probably doesn't appeal to physicists. I'm sorry, this is magnitudes. But the point is that even this little telescope that is scanning the sky can cover any type of supernova. Um, so the J band is the red point. So that's the filter we use in the infrared. Um, so we go down to 16th mag. So we can cover any type of supernova, its shock breakout, its progenitor, the whole nine yards. So that as long as weather cooperates, right, we will not miss an event like this. And now it would be nice to have a, a copy in the southern hemisphere. That's one fourth of the sky that we can't see. Um, but this is a good start um, to not missing a supernova in our own galaxy. Um, similarly with classical novae, classical novae are white dwarfs where there's a little bit of material transferred and a thermonuclear runaway. They're not as spectacular as supernovae, instead of a billion times as bright as the sun, they're only about a million times as bright as the sun. But now um, they're starting to show shocks in the system, shocks that are detectable in the gamma rays. And the predictions, again theoretical, are that every time you see shocks in the gamma rays from classical novae, you should also see a dust tip in the infrared bands. So um, this is now something, again, we can test, because we're imaging this whole area night after night, um, such that we can get a complete inventory of J-band light curves of classical novae. So now let's go on to enshrouded um, supernovae. So uh, this is self-obscuration of core collapse supernovae. So here I give an example from um, another infrared search that uh, my group is doing. Uh, called SPIRITS. Um, so this is a project with uh, NASA Spitzer uh, Space Telescope, uh, NASA's fourth great observatory. Um, and this telescope is very close to my heart. As uh, Brian mentioned, I was an undergrad at Cornell. Um, and on August 25, 2003, um, uh, this telescope was launched. And I, had the, uh, I was just super lucky because I was an RA in the lab of Professor Jim Houck, who built the infrared spectrograph on Spitzer. 
And uh, you, know, you could see the data flow in from this, this amazing new uh, eyes on the sky. And um, you know, I think just seeing all the excitement and science flow <laughs> Um, and the enthusiasm of the group is one of the reasons I'm an astronomer today. Um, so anyway, many years since, uh, this is actually Spitzer's last year of operations because uh, NASA has decided to, to send the kill switch. So we only have one more year of Spitzer uh, before it's turned off. Um, but um, in these last few years of operations, um, Spitzer uh, the, was kind enough to give us time to search for infrared transients. Now the Spitzer Space Telescope is in space. So it doesn't have this glaring night sky background problem that we have on Earth. So that's a huge advantage. But it doesn't have a big camera. It doesn't have a wide field camera. So it only has a five arc minute by five arc minute camera. It's a pencil beam. So what we can do, or the best thing we could do with this, is to look at individual galaxies. So we just picked 200 of the nearest and brightest galaxies and started to image them over and over and over again with this with the Space Telescope to look for infrared transients. So this was the uh, PhD topic of my first graduate student, Jacob Jenkson. And the idea was to look for infrared transients in the mid-infrared. And this is what we found to date. So we've identified more than 131 transients. And um, if you plot them on um, a diagram, which is luminosity, intrinsic luminosity, bright, faint, uh, time scales of 10 to 1,000 days, there's a zoo of explosions that we didn't know about previously in the infrared that um, show up here. So Jacob focused on the brightest of these infrared explosions. And I'm going to tell you more about those, because they look like supernovae, except they were supernovae in galaxies so nearby that it was surprising that we had completely missed them in optical surges. So um, here's an example of a merging galaxy. This is IC2163, for those of you who may recognize this. And there are three spirits transients in the same galaxy um, in uh, whatever, four years or so um, that, that Jacob found. Um, so if you look at, if you count up all of the different supernovae in these galaxies that were discovered in the infrared, that were infrared bright, but optically so faint that they were completely missed by optical searches, the fraction of optically missed sup supernovae was as high as 38 point, and Jacob would say 38.5%. Um, and previously, I mean, people, people have debated this for a very long time, you know, how obscured and how extinct and how reddened are supernovae. And people have tried to make um, these plots of number of supernovae as a function of their intrinsic extinction. So a lot of extinction is on the right, less extinction is on the left. And what Jacob finds is that even with his um, sample of just 200 galaxies being monitored for five years, he has an extremely heavy tail. He has some supernovae that could be as extinct as 12 to 14 mags. Um, certainly some that are between, many that are between two and eight mags. So there are many, many supernovae, and even as a lower limit on the fraction that are being missed by optical surveys, there's as much as a factor of two uh, discrepancy in the rates of co-collapse supernovae. And this is interesting because um, a few years ago there was much, there was again much debate on how many supernovae you expect um, from simulations of cosmic star formation rate um, and how many are actually seen by op optical surveys. And that discrepancy was the same order of magnitude, roughly a factor of two. So the answer might be as simple as, as dust to explain these um, events. <coughs> and this dust could be, three minutes? Yeah, okay. Uh, but that dust could not just be um, uh, the line of sight dust because of our own galaxy or because the galaxy that we're looking at is edge on, but dust that is actually coming directly from the supernova. So Jacob sees in his sample multiple outbursts um, even before the final explosion. So this means the supernova, the, the star, the massive star is throwing out a lot of material, right? And this material is sort of self-obscuring the, the star so that when it explodes, that its own material that it was losing along the way of of um, exploding is what's obscuring it. So he sees these multiple outbursts of explosion, uh, eruptions um, before it explodes. Um, another type of um, a supernova that he's seeing are, are supernovae which show these giant water features. Supernovae don't make water. So this, this can't be actually coming from the supernova itself. So what could this be? We don't know. If you have an idea, then we'll take it. 
But our best guess right now is that perhaps the supernova is exploding in a molecular cloud, in the same molecular cloud that actually gave birth to the star that's still around and not completely destroyed along the way of the star's life and when the supernova exploded. Uh, maybe some supernovae are not strong enough or for whatever reason don't destroy the molecular cloud that they are formed in. And for the first time, maybe they're seeing a hint of that actual molecular cloud that gave birth to the supernova. So um, with that, let me conclude um, with the unexpected. So there are many, many transients that Spirit is already finding, which are in the luminosity gap between novae and supernovae. We only have wild guesses as to what these things are. Uh, we hope that JWST will launch so we can get spectra and get some answers um, as to what these things are. Um, and we hope Spitzer will, will go long enough so that we know how bright these things are when JWST launches so we can take spectra. Uh, I'm just going to skip forward on all of these details um, and go back to the slide where we've just started tasting the tip of the iceberg as far as exploring the dynamic infrared sky is concerned. And already for a multitude of different reasons, we are starting to appreciate how rich this landscape is and how much more there is to learn about stellar remnants, stellar fates, how they form, um, what fireworks follow. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. Uh, there should be a lot more fun ahead because the dynamic infrared sky is ripe for exploration. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'll take some questions. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think it would be nice to put these telescopes on, on Mauna Kea or in Chile. It would only help the experiments do that. But just the practicality is, is yeah, putting them at Palomar is a huge practical advantage. Um, because when you're commissioning these small projects, Palomar really has the infrastructure and experience with robotic telescopes. So we actually don't, uh, we collect data every single night. There's no graduate student or postdoc who's awake or can be expected to be awake every single night. So uh, with Palomar Observatory, the staff have a lot of experience with robotic telescopes and making sure they're safe with minimal intervention and they perform at very high efficiency. Um, so even though we take a hit from um, the fact that um, you know, the, the, it's a little windy at Palomar, the seeing is not as good as at other sites, it's a little brighter at Palomar, there are all the slight pollution problems that are cropping up. Um, the convenience of it being a short drive from Caltech so a grad student can go up there anytime, or a postdoc can go up there anytime. And the fact that the staff there has so much experience, um, absolutely fantastic experience with working with these and supporting robotic operations of wide field surveys, the efficiency is key. Um, you know, take wins. Yeah, but no staff, no, no experienced engineers on Wilson anymore. They were there, you know, one time, but not anymore. Fantastic question. In fact, um, a decade ago when, when people first thought of obscured supernovae and trying to solve this problem of star formation rate and optical supernova rate being off by factor of two, the first thing that they tried was look at luminous infrared galaxies and ultra-luminous infrared galaxies where there's tons of star formation. So even if you look at one galaxy, you expect to see a lot of um, numbers in, in these events. Um, but those searches didn't go very well because it's, a, it's um, again, for very boring technical reasons which is that when you're subtracting images to look for supernovae, if the core is very cuspy, it doesn't subtract well. So even if they exist, and just for very boring technical reasons, they just were not successful in finding things because it's just a software problem to try to identify transients in this. So, so Spitz actually spent a significant amount of time, not in my program, another program by another PI. Is it it's cuspy, yeah, from the star. You mod, yeah. So you model, it, model the point spread function from the stars and you try and apply it to the galaxy. Um, so when we designed our survey, we weren't actually trying to solve this obscured supernova problem. We said, okay, we just want to find what transients exist in 
200 of the nearest galaxies. So we have elliptical galaxies, we have little tiny dwarfs, we have, um, we have star forming galaxies, we have a zoo of very different types of galaxies because it was just an exploration of the infrared sky. And we happen to find that even in normal galaxies without extreme star formation, there's a crazy number of obscured supernovae, right? So if you looked, if you were able to solve the technical problem and searched in, in ULUGs and LUGs, I think that, that'd be even more. So I think whatever we're saying is a very conservative lower limit. On, and we're not seeing all that there is to see for co collapse supernovae with optical surveys. No, that's a great question. I actually didn't touch upon it at all. Um, so the host galaxy of the neutron star neutron star merger uh, is a galaxy called NGC 4993. Uh, this galaxy is an S0 galaxy. And there are some beautiful HST images of this galaxy. And if you try to model it, in fact, you see evidence for um, um, all kinds of structure in the galaxy suggesting that there was a recent merger in this galaxy. Um, Relatively massive. So it was the third most massive galaxy amongst the 40 in our list to search. So um, yeah, amongst the more massive galaxies, I don't remember the exact mass at the top of my head. Uh, but there, I can point you to several papers that go into details characterizing the, the galaxy properties of this, of this merger. Great question. <laughs> 